Welcome to Unstoppable Podcast with Harry Sardinas, inspiring conversations with influential millionaires, investors, thought leaders, entrepreneurs who are making a massive difference with their innovative products and services and sharing the challenges and wisdom of how they sold their first million. How would you like to achieve your first million? And today, we have Rupert with us, which is the founder of a filmmaking company. So Rupert, we have the first question for you. What are the five steps to make your first million? Sure. I think, I mean, a lot goes into it, obviously. I think it's a very complicated and difficult thing, and it really depends on the industry and the approach you want, you want to take. Uh, but the first one is focusing on providing real value. I think that's really important. I think that there's a lot of like if you're really hyped and excited about making money and that's what you want to do, you can almost become too focused on that thing and not like what value are you going to provide to customers? What problem are you going to solve in the world? All that kind of thing. And I think particularly with younger people, that could be an issue. Um, two is like starting small, but get started. I think that the biggest, the biggest problem I think when it comes to like business failure is effectively people just not starting like young people that I've spoken to or that I've helped you know, they find it really difficult to just get moving, but like doing like a really small version of what you want to do in a really simplistic way um, is enough to just get started. And in video production, which is what I'm in, that would be like built, starting to build a portfolio or just making stuff every week or whatever. But I think that getting started, starting small, not over obsessing with like a product you're going to take to market and trying to spend loads of money or raise money or whatever, just get moving as much as quickly as you can. I think just keeping going, I think that, you know, I don't really have any magic formulas, but I think that like business, you know, can be pretty relentless. It can be pretty stressful. It can push you back a lot. And I think that a lot of issues you might even have in yourself or difficulties you might personally have will end up like manifesting themselves and the challenges in front of you. But we don't really hear that often about, you know, all the difficult times businesses had before they, you know, got to the success that they are sort of today. And often we sort of view successes as just like overnight that they've just happened. So keeping going is a big one. I think setting yourself clear goals once you're sort of moving is really important because like when you first start, you're like, you're the accountant, you're the marketer, you're the salesperson, you're everything. And that's a really, really challenging phase where you have to be like a real generalist um, and but a lot of entrepreneurs, I think, really like that phase because it's really exciting. You're learning new things all the time, all that kind of thing. And then as you start to scale, you have to kind of become a bit more specialized and work out what you're actually good at and what value you provide to the business. And I think setting yourself clear goals can really help um, that side of things, help, um, you know, keep you focused. Um, and then I think that, you know, and kind of work out what value you need to add to the business. Um, and then finally, is it, that's what leads me on to like not getting distracted. I think that once you have started to build a business that's showing real promise, you know, you've got to remember that it's still very vulnerable, you know, in its earlier phases, you know, well beyond like a million revenue, your business is still vulnerable or can be yeah, depending on absolutely. the type of business. I come obviously from a video production agency background and it's like, it's very people orientated tech businesses maybe they run themselves a little bit better than than people-based businesses but i think not getting distracted at the wrong moment you know if you're a passionate entrepreneur you've got a lot of ideas the odds are once you get moving you start to hit some roadblocks you're going to start going oh this thing over here looks quite shiny and quite nice maybe i'll have a go at that so i think that staying yeah staying focused is really important to kind of then kind of meet those goals um and working out what those goals are for you on like a personal level is that like an exit of five million pounds is that just having like a business that almost runs itself and you get 15 grand a month you know whatever it is you know from a from a financial point of view setting those goals and then and then focusing on it and not getting distracted and tell us why do you decide to become an entrepreneur what happened do you have any entrepreneur in your family or friends so how you decide to become an entrepreneur no, so I, I don't really have any, like my parents, like my mum started a business or bought a business at the same time as I started my production wow. company. Um, okay. But my dad's a police officer, although he's very entrepreneurial and very intelligent. He, you know, he's a police officer and not really in that sort of industry. My mum's in like the property space, but she sort of started, you know, from quite humble beginnings as like an inventory clerk. So she would just check people out of properties and then went on to to buy the business that she was working for. Wow. Um, but for me, I was just always really fascinated, like, my parents had like a difficult um, period of time financially when I was younger, where they were doing quite well. And then there was an economic crash and they kind of got 
um, you know, had had problems as a result of that financial problems. And I saw the impact it had on my parents quite a young age. And I just thought like, I don't want to ever like, I want to kind of help them and I don't want to ever have to like deal with this. So I started to get a bit obsessed with like businesses and making money. And I used to import stuff from China. I used to sell popcorn on the playground. I used to, you know, pick herbs and sell them, which sounds very uh, problematic, but it was just mint, um, you know, in the village and and all these sorts of things. And then I started a business with my mum, renting out Nerf guns for kids parties, which was, uh, you know, a fun, a fun kind of, venture and I started to make videos promoting to promote that on YouTube some of those videos start to go viral and then I was like oh, oh the video production thing's really cool I love this um so that's how I got into video production and then I kind of pivoted so I've always like growing up done lots of different little businesses some of which were total disasters like trying to start my own makeup brand some of them were like selling ebooks and guides online and those did really well like teaching people how to fix the red ring of death on their Xbox back in the day um so yeah, that's kind of my my background. I was always quite entrepreneurial and quite interested in making money and building things. From what was your source? From what were you learning? You you became to you become interested to become an entrepreneur, and uh, but uh, any book, any internet information, what what was your source? I think they're like. You know, it was mostly just the internet. It was mostly, and like, I'm very practical as a person. Like I like just like doing things and like trying things. So a lot of the stuff in my early years, I didn't read any entrepreneurial books. I maybe got about 10 pages into like Alan Sugar's biography. That <laughs> you know, other than that, it wasn't much more than that. But, that, you know, I, I would kind of be like wanting to start businesses and just would be trying to problem solve specific issues. But in the early days, it was mostly like, just trying, like yeah. just doing loads of different things, seeing what worked. And then only now do I make more of an effort to read specific things or learn specific things. Um, I think there's some great business books out there, you know, Built to Sell by John Warrillow, um, Good to Great, Jim Collins, um, you know, Netflix, No Rules, Rules, Traction, I really rate. So there's some definitely some great business books out there, but like that's only now that I've scaled a, a you know, a bigger business that I'm kind of like, problem solving for specific things and trying to like elevate the business beyond just maybe like intuition or things that I've, you know, experienced before. So here the, we always share with the entrepreneurs that to become an entrepreneur is a skill, it's a skill base. So the more you practice, the better you, the better you become. It's a, the trial and error is a, is a process that every entrepreneur need to have because at the end of the day, you have to develop, to develop the skill. I don't think that if if, um, if people again if people go, learn how to swim or drive by they will never learn by reading a book. The more at the end of the day you have to swim into the pool and you have to <laughs> to learn how to swim or to drive the same thing. Some people now drive and they even speak on the phone, but <laughs> it's because they have such a skill that now they can do it. But at the beginning they were trying so. To be an entrepreneur, at the end of the day, it's a trial and error, and uh, you have to practice until you develop the skill. There is a lot of skills, and maybe like like you shared with us, Robert, you have these different um, you have these these different small businesses at the beginning, but maybe until you find your passion, something very productive that the, all these ventures did for you is to. Uh, to, to help you to develop the skill as an entrepreneur, right? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> absolutely. And like, you don't want, I almost think that like, you don't want to succeed too quickly as well. Like if you just have a business that suddenly just takes off, that's amazing. And that's super exciting. But equally, like you're now running a business with very little experience, you know, at a certain scale. So like for me, I'm, I'm quite like grateful that I'm that I kind of stuck it out for like 10 years or whatever of just like messing about with different things because now like I'll you know we'll come into a That's difficult key, situation yeah. or a difficult moment and I can kind of go back through you know I've been running perspective for eight years so it's like it's quite unusual for me to face like a brand new problem it's like we've you know gone through very very difficult cash flow periods we've gone through difficult staff periods we've gone through moments where our product isn't good enough we've gone through you know like all the things that are like little disasters or whatever now you know when something pops up and there's a fire or whatever it is you know i can kind of like go back to the 
you know, those experiences and be like, oh, it's going to be fine. Like we did this, this and this before this time, maybe we'll do this, that and that and we'll, we'll turn it around. So, so yeah, I completely agree. I think that that skill set and practice as an entrepreneur is invaluable, both for the practicality, but also just confidence. I think that, you know, it, it's quite a, it can be quite a drain on your ego running a business and you need to be confident and be able to lead it. And I think that's really important. Some people say that an image is is better than thousand words. And I would say that a video, a good video, is better than a million words. So how this journey in the starting about the video production, you already covered a little bit. Because one thing is to do a video. The other thing is to do a high quality video for for companies like you 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 share with with us before the broadcasting that you you have produced from Red Bull and from another big companies also. So why um so what is the difference between a video, a good video, and an amazing video? Yeah, I think that's I think that's an interesting question. I think. Um, my background was like, yeah, I start, ran that Nerf gun business, or Nerf blaster business, renting a gun, you know, these blasts for kids parties, then like um, made videos to promote it, got really into that, decided I want to be a filmmaker, made a World War One, like a load of films and was making video content all the time. And, um, and then I made a... Um, like a short film that I took to Cannes Film Festival, um, thinking like, I'm going to be a big shot Hollywood director, age like 20 or whatever I was. Went to Cannes, didn't like it, didn't like the environment, wasn't what I thought it would be, didn't think it was for me. Then I made a, a documentary where I longboarded or skateboarded across America from LA to New York. So I skateboarded wow. 3,000 miles with a support crew. We made a documentary, which we sold to Netflix a few years ago. Um, and that's still up on Netflix. You can type in Longboarding LA to NY. Wow, what's um, the name? Uh, longboarding LA to NY. Wow. So you you are you are the person skating or you're the person filming? Both. Oh, my God. You took a crew with you or how you managed to do that? Yeah, we had a crew of... Um, we had a crew of like four people. So like basically like four British guys flew out and then we had three Americans that like ran a support van. And then we just like sleep on the floor of the van at night and then skate during the day. Wow. That's amazing. And then you, you now here's the thing, how, you know, because uh, Netflix in particular, they're very demanding with the quality that they, if, if um, I'm aware, if, if you don't produce a certain quality, they, they won't even take it. So how you guys knew how to record all this in high quality? I think it was like, technically, I don't think the film is where it needs to or should be, really. Like at age 20, like I think that the filming can be is quite messy. It's shot on like a 4K camera, but it's like, you know, we were still learning. But I think that it was just about, it was a very authentic documentary. And so I think that we got a lot of free passes in that respect. Like it's very much like, Or like two of the guys gave up in the first four days of the four of us. Oh. Like it was brutal. Like <laughs> on the second day, one of the support guys was skating with his shirt off mm -hmm. and he came off for like 30 miles an hour and like scraped all his body open and was covered in blood. And mm -hmm. the one of the board got hit by a, like a bus and got destroyed. So it's like, it's just very real. It's like very, uh, it was, you know, it was legitimately dangerous <laughs> what we did. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so I think it holds its own in that respect. I mean, it's a real adventure. But the quality definitely was there. Because yeah, so it was there, there enough. Do you know I mean if I could redo it now, I'd, I'd absolutely make it a lot more beautiful. But yeah, it was, it was enough. And I think it's more about the editing and the narrative, and you know how we kind of pieced it together. I mean, I've been, uh, I have the pleasure to be as a as a secondary actor or, or in in several films, uh, my girlfriend, she owns a book publishing company and uh, and one of the books she publishes is from from our friend Monica. She's a film producer. So we have been in in some of her films. So I, I have seen all the works that goes behind the camera when, when you're producing films, right? And I think that um, this is these skills can be applied to business. The videos can be in uh, amazing because I think the movies um, 
I see the, the whole the 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 way that the quality of the sound need to be the way that the even the camera they have they are, they are big and and they are worried they are, they are pay a lot of attention to recording different angles to to uh, record the reactions sometimes um, one scene we have to shot it maybe like 10 15 times because from this angle from another angle from shorter from longer from another reaction now this now that and i think that in order to make a compelling video for uh, for a business for a brand now a brand brand awareness and a branding is this piece of of the business that um, people don't know how important it is, so people don't know. Uh, it's very difficult to to account how uh, because for advertising, okay, you say, oh, I'm spending two thousand, I'm making four thousand sales. This is good, but building the brand is different um, because um, it never ends. And but at the end of the day, when you're gonna sell your business. You need to sell your brand, and uh, and this is where the real value comes in the end of the day. So I'm building the brand with good videos is a massive value that business can have. So how important do you think that the skills of of that you that you have as a documentary producer as film producer do you think because the script also in my in a movie a movie even a documentary even if it's twenty minutes if it's thirty minutes. You have to be able to write the script in order to keep the audience engaged these thirty minutes, or what they're gonna check out, and um, and and this is what you want in business. You want in business that uh, that people watch your video, that people engage with the video at all times, the people um, uh, see your your values or your mission through through that video. So how do you how do you think that? Um, in my opinion, the skills that uh, you guys have for making films is way more than what it's really needed for business. But do you think that a lot of things from movies can be applied to to videos in business? Yeah, absolutely. I think that there's yeah, there's loads to learn from from all kind of media. I think particularly like online media as well. I think actually is more you know there's more to learn to, from that. I think that you know uh, films deal with a captive audience. So it's like you go to the movie theater, you can sit through two minutes of credits, no advert or like online video or Instagram reel or anything could have two minutes of credits at the beginning. Like it would be a disaster, you know? <laughs> so, you know, I think that there's a difference between having a captive audience and having an audience that you're kind of reaching out to for the first time and trying to like slow down and be like, hey, come look at our stuff. So I, I take kind of more inspiration in that respect from like, you know, top creators producing stuff on, you know, on, on kind of YouTube and Instagram and whatever else. Um, and the, the kind of retention hooks that they use and the retention techniques they use. But yeah, I think that it, yeah, making like really good, strong video content can make a massive difference to a business. It can, it can reap huge benefits or it can render a whole channel, channel useless. If you make like a bad social ad and then you start putting paid media behind that, it's not going to produce results for you. If you're not persuasive, doesn't matter how many people you go up to, if you don't have a persuasive video, you know, you could show it to 20, every person on planet earth and no one might buy it. So you know, I think that having an effective creative makes the world a difference. Um, and I think that so much of the work into making a good video goes into before you hit go on the camera. Like it's the strategy, it's like the thinking, it's, you know, the audience um, research, it's everything else and working out how to make something that's going to be compelling um, and how to do it. And like you say, the sort of scripting and the narrative is very, very important, even on a six second reel. So, yeah. Yeah, and let's talk about retention because the uh, YouTube, for example, they don't know if your video is good or not. The only thing that they can measure is the thumbnail, so the click to rate when people click, and how long the people uh, are been watching mm -hmm. this video. And if a lot of people are clicking and a lot of people are watching the video entirely, YouTube will assume that your video is good and we put it on the top of the page <laughs> because they, they this this is the this is how the algorithm works they can they don't know they cannot watch the video to see if it's good or bad they only can measure your retention 
and uh, and how many people are clicking there and the formula is pretty much that one a good click through rate plus a good retention it will get you on the first on, on the top of the youtube search for a, a, any keyword which is sometimes is as important as being in google as youtube is one of the biggest search engines in the world so the other thing is something that you talk about which is uh, the video go viral so what are the secrets to make a viral video i think that it's about understanding and knowing your audience and making something that will really excite them like like you say you know youtube take the click through rate and the retention they decide whether or not it's a good video based on those metrics um and then they push it out to more people but like ultimately operating in say like entertainment just as like a top level thing is like a nightmare because it's like how do you make something that's highly compelling to everyone? Like that's a real challenge. But if you're, you know, a company or a creator, um, you know, the best thing you can do is have like a niche, you know, have a clear audience because it makes it way easier to persuade those people to click on a video. And like, you know, my dad watches these like 40 minute walking videos, which is like a guy who just like goes for like a long walk and shows like different routes in the part of the UK that he likes. And it's like, you could not persuade a mainstream audience to watch that. Like, it's not, uh -huh. uh, you know, it's those videos are never going to have 40 million views. But like, in terms of like, what my dad wants from a piece of content and what makes him click on the piece of content, like, you know, they're sort of nailing it. So I think that niching down and having a clear audience is going to be your first clear step to finding an audience. And then like, if you want to have a broader audience, then you can kind of broaden the content as time goes on, but build a core audience in a specific niche sailing gardening you know solving a specific problem that people are searching for whatever and then i'd kind of grow out from there so yeah if i could make a viral video every time i'd i'd, I'd be retired by now but like <laughs> that's the kind of best best first steps to take yeah so there are some patterns also to make a viral video but at the end of the day sometimes uh, it depends of how the algorithm um uh take those videos and, and and sometimes you hit the metrics. Um, however, there is something that um, that is very, very important. It's something that is our control, which is, again, you talk about retention. So what are the um, the best techniques to, to increase retention rate in a video? Yeah, so retention, there's a few things. I think that minimizing exposition is a really important step to increasing retention. Like, you know, the less introduction or explanation um, you can have, the better. Because the second someone says, hello, my name's Rupert. Good to see you, blah, blah, blah. Today in this video, you know, all of that is just like lost. So you don't need that. Um, secondly, like, again, it's like the main metric is average retention. So having a very abrupt ending is another little hack you can do. So like, rather than being like having a long drawn out one minute ending, like most people in the end of the videos ending, like the retention graph just goes like that and they just click off. So that's why so many big YouTubers, they have very abrupt, you know, four second outros, things like that. Um, so not being too overindulgent. And then I think it's like a trial and error process. It depends on your audience. Like in terms of maximizing retention, you know, monitoring in previous videos, what, what did well and what, what kind of captivated them and, 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 you know, and then the stuff where they clicked off or maybe they were disinterested, you know, sort of handling that. So I think that that kind of retention stuff is, is um, yeah, that's, that's sort of how I'd approach it. It's like nice, succinct, short intro, you know, raising like points of conflict or jeopardy or questions, keeping people engaged until those things are resolved and then rounding off pretty quickly. Okay. Now let's, let's talk about the building the team and you guys, you know, with the, you said that you recently came back from Japan. So you were, you were shooting in Japan. So mm -hmm. you take your camera there, you rent it there. How, how the process work? Yeah. we, we well, What were you doing in Japan? Uh, I was filming a, a big project for Red Bull, uh, which I oh, wow. not talk too much about. But yeah, we, so we were there for, I was there for two weeks. Um, and then, uh, yeah, and we shipped all the all the camera kit and the crew. We worked with some local crew um, and then we rented a bit of stuff out there, but most of it was just our cool stuff. 
I bet that Red Bull is very happy with you guys. Yes, yeah? since since the your documentary Netflix, you know, doing crazy things. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I hope so. I, I bet hope they so. Are, yeah, they're, they're so happy with you guys. This is the crazy guys that I need for my stuff. Yeah, but Red Bull, for example, is a good brand, right? They they create very high quality videos, and they um and 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 that um had been a powerful brand. Let's talk about this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can put Red Bull uh, as example. How do you think that video and the high quality production that Red Bull produce in all the the videos uh, has helped them to bring to be a so powerful brand? Remember that the drinks industry is the mo one of the most competitive industries in this planet. Yeah, and we have Coca-Cola and so on. So what? So what? How do you think that um, that the high quality video production have been had taken a, a good part in in building an amazing brand for Red Bull? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, obviously they're like wildly successful as a brand, and and you know they've done a lot of unbelievable things over the years that have made up special moments of you know or things that we will all remember. They um, do a lot of cool videos. They make a lot of cool videos. There we go. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but they've made some, like, even for me, when I was, like, really young and I was watching YouTube, I was watching some of the stuff, early stuff they were pushing out, and I absolutely loved it. So for me, it, you know, it, I love working with them. Um, but I think that there's a few things. I think one of the interesting things about them that they've really nailed is, like, most companies are very, like, self oriented and so as a result, they go up to consumers and they just ask them for things straight away. They're like, here's my video. Please sit down and watch it. Give it two minutes of your time. People are like, well, maybe. And like sometimes with ads or whatever, you know, they get forced to watch it. And they watch it and there's very little value for them. It's like, let me tell you about my company and what it does. And this is why we're so exciting and everything else. And most people just don't think they care. Um, and they get targeted with thousands of pieces of media every single day. So they just are not interested. Whereas like uh, Red Bull have taken a completely different strategy, which is like, let me entertain you. Let me, I've got something to show you. You're going to love it. Like, do you want to check this out? It's the craziest thing you've ever seen in your life. Isn't that awesome? So it's like, you know, immediately they're building a relationship with, 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 you know, the public and, you know, the customers and everything else. And then it's like, when you go into a shop, there's going to be a Red Bull on the you know thing if you're looking for like an energy drink or for a boost or something or you want to feel connected to or, or hold something in your hand that you feel a little bit proud to be associated with and be a part of you know from their motorsport stuff to people jumping from space then it's like cool i'll buy the red bull i'll spend the extra 30p or whatever it might be so i feel like you know they don't front load the ask whereas so many companies front load the ask and i think that that's a problem yeah and then, uh, Rupert, the um, let's talk about uh, the script of the video in order to, um, or the sequence, right? To have to achieve what we're talking, you know, the amazing rotation rate that this is what the holy grail, like everybody wants. Uh, what um, what what few techniques do you use in order to write a script that? Uh, that will keep the audience engaged. Yeah, I think providing them with value. So entertaining. Sometimes the script is, is even visual. Sometimes it's not talking, but it still has to be written, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So it might be like our com our company ad, for instance. We have like this main advert that we run on paid media and sits on our website. Um, and I just talk about the company all the way through. I say, "Hi, we spent the pictures. We do this. We do that. And we do that." And that's why we're different and whatever. So it's like, cool, we've been very selfish in that respect. But then what we've done is we've provided entertainment by putting me in ridiculous places, doing ridiculous things while I'm saying these things. So I'm yeah. being pulled on top of a glacier by huskies. I'm stood on top of a plane. I'm, you know, leaning out the back of a drift car. It's like all these different, in one of the previous ads, like there's a scene where I'm pregnant and the client is like the, the you know, the, baby partner or whatever and we're looking at an ultra scan of a video loading like so it's like i think that in that respect it's just about it's just about assessing how you can offer people value and like sometimes sure like if you're in like the pharmaceutical space or something you're gonna you're gonna do something that's more like you know straight down the line and straight edge but you can still kind of 
hold people's attention with like nice graphics and just like a well put together story and moving between a few different people speaking instead of just one person speaking um you know showing not telling i think that's obviously always a good thing to like showcase things not just say it so yeah so i think in terms of building stuff to keep retention i just think it's about always about thinking about why would people be watching right now what's the point what's in it for them like you see all these little retention instagram reels at the moment where like somebody's tied up they've got loads of rope on them and then there's a car with a rope attached to the back of it and it's driving away really quickly and it's like they're speaking and it's like the audience as an audience member you're just waiting to see if the rope's connected and if they're gonna go like whoa so you know i think that it's yeah it's just about offering value it's just about giving something to your audience a reason to watch because they'll just there's a million other options of things they could be watching but i do like what you said right you know even if you're saying something that is boring if you can entertain them at the same time, they you can keep them engaged. Makes sense. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, because they they will be consuming the content, but also they are entertained. And I think the uh, today's business, like like before today, uh, a lot of people are. Um, we believe that in order to be the business today, it's better even to be the community first. And to have the product after to offer to the community, <laughs> uh, but a big, a, a very important part of of build the community is to create the content to create high quality content. It's because if you have high quality content, uh, the community will grow bigger. I have as a hobby, I have a I have a um, Cuban band, right? And we were doing some parties, and we were playing music with a with with a speaker and the people used to come and dance salsa so there you go we are i'm playing this music everybody coming for free and we were playing this music and everybody was dancing salsa guess what happened i decide to have my own band we call it buena vista london club and we start to play salsa with the band guess what happened <laughs> and more people came so what happened is the more high quality content, the bigger the community grew, right? And I think uh, this uh, that's what video um, plays a big part in growing a community is because if the community consume content, so if you are able to produce high quality content, this community is gonna grow and grow and grow. And this is the most important thing if you're running a business because uh, you can offer pros and services to this community. So what are the secrets, Rupert, for creating high quality content? And what is your definition about high quality content? I think high quality content is content that people want to watch. I don't necessarily think that's like needs to be shot on a cinema camera with a cinema lens. I just think if it has an audience. So I think identifying that audience, making something that they're going to love, um and providing that value to them i think that's high quality content that's that's it yeah. done that's e it's easy to say that but that's actually a very challenging <laughs> thing to do it's easy to be like, oh, just make a good video everyone will love it it's fine oh, um, so hard and and again yeah sometimes uh but sometimes people get confused right sometimes people say well quality is not important because look this video have no quality i have million views and then other people say, well, um, this video is too long. People are want to people want to watch short things. And at the end of the day, um, when when the content is there and the and the quality is there, I think that it doesn't matter how long it is, it doesn't matter uh well it might in my opinion matters a little bit the quality that have been shot. Uh, but do you think that the length of the video has any impact in the retention? Uh, no, I think that it's easier to entertain people for a short period of time. It's um, easier. I agree you with know. you. But that so has I think to do that... with the length. Because look at the movies. We watch them for 90 minutes, yeah? So, and, and, and nobody gets bored out of the movie, right? Because they are designed to keep you engaged for those 90 minutes, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so yeah, there's a lot of like talk about how like the next generation have a shorter retention span and blah 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 blah. And well, I they don't watch movies like, then. It's rubbish. Yeah, they just 
yeah. these have fire Absolutely like I agree with you yeah you know we're not being entertained by watching like the first ever movie was like a, just a black and white shot of a train entering a station and people's minds were blown people like ran out of the cinema terrified that a train was going to crash through the screen <laughs> and it's just like our expectations as consumers of like content now is like so significantly elevated because it's so competitive to create content and to add value to people's lives and in that in that way so the expectations are so much higher and like a lot of companies haven't you know gotten their head around how to do a good job of that so you know they're all they're like oh no one wants to watch my video content because they've got shorter attention spans it's like I've just got better things to watch mate yeah, absolutely and i think that um the i'm a big fan of, of of long videos a lot of people have told me oh don't do this podcast so long people are gonna get bored they're not gonna watch it and i'm like you know we whoever is interested I, I can guarantee you that whoever this podcast is for they will watch it all the episode from the beginning to the end uh is uh, and not necessarily have to be uh uh i agree with you it's easy to make it short right this is the easy thing to do <laughs> the complex maybe could be uh create a long uh, longer pieces of of or videos that they have they're interested enough so people can watch them completely and get a lot of value. However, I think that Robert, I think that the people that are finding that doing short videos is easy because they don't have your filmmaking background. Because for you, you know, if you're doing documentary 20 minutes, half an hour, you have to make sure that people stay the half an hour there. So every minute of this half an hour, you make sure that the content is there so the people stay there. And I think that uh, more fair would be say that um, it's not that short videos are better than long videos, it's that not everyone has the skill to create a, a long-term video with a high level of engagement. Do you agree with me? Yeah. That's, I think this, this is, this is what, what it is. I'm a big fan of long videos and long engagement. Yeah, I'm still working on the case. <laughs> I need to read a little bit more about films. I do learn a lot when I'm going to... I've been already in four movies, I think. Four movies, yeah. Um, as a feeling actor, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, eventually, we get to one day uh, in <laughs> talking role. My girlfriend, Lily, she has a speaking role in <laughs> one of the movies. And oh. uh, yeah, yeah, she's an MD, IMDb, or you look in Google and uh, her name appears there. And um, but the whole thing is that um, I think that we um, because you know if you're building a brand, you want um, Red Bull, for example. Of course, if you do a short video, it's good. But if you can do a little bit bigger and you have more time, that retention, this client is, again, you have more time to build relationship if you can make a longer video. Now, it's more difficult, absolutely. <laughs> but if, 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 it's, if it's get done right, you can you have more time to build that relationship and create that relationship with, with the client. And the more time you have, the more relationship, the more strong is the relationship because, you know, the... Uh, the relationship uh, requires time, right? You cannot find a girl and say, marry me right now, they will slap you. <laughs> but eventually, if you go out several time and you spend time with that girl, eventually you can ask to marry her. But it's a time that is important that uh, that goes into this process to create what we call a strong relationship with the business, the same thing. So the more time that those brands stay with the consumer, the more strong relationship they can have. And that's why it's important to create a video that they will be longer, but they can uh, keep the client, um, increase the retention. Okay? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay. So, Robert, if somebody have a cool company there and is listening to our podcast right now, and they say, oh, my God, I want this guy to make a cool video for my company, <laughs> how they can find you, how the process works? Uh, if they just go to perspectivepictures.com, um, then they can, you know, then they can fill in a contact form, have a little look at some of the stuff we've done, uh, pop us an email, and I'll have a chat to him. There you go. And with that note, uh, 
guys, thank you so much, Robert, for your time. Yeah, fellow UK member, finally, man, it's been so hard. So many people from United States. I'm happy. It's not that I'm not happy with the people from United States. I'm very happy. But we have the podcast, a lot of Americans coming in, a lot of people from Australia, also from New Zealand, our fellows, UK and Europeans, they're showing up in a lower rate. So we want more people from Europe in, in the podcast. <laughs> and <laughs> so thank you so much for joining us and for you guys following us in, in YouTube, in our social media and Spotify and Apple. See you in our next episode of Honestable, how brave entrepreneurs like Rupert break that wall and achieve the first million. Bye for now. Follow us for more interviews with world's most influential, audacious entrepreneurs that overcame challenges and adversity, providing you with the blueprint of how they sold their first million so you can grow your business exponentially.